can worship together. We're all going to sing together. To God be the glory. To God.
Well, it's wonderful to be here this morning. My name is Nathan Stetson. I'm from Sars, Ohio. <laughs> And back to the shop table is. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Stoll, and I'm from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. In case I haven't had the opportunity to meet you, my name is Artie, and this is my wife, Jean, over here. And we are delighted to be back with you again. Look forward to the wonderful week of ministry together. Once again, thank you for all your preparations for us. I want to tell you just a little bit about the ministry, in case you're not aware of what, the, what is going on and what the team is involved in. The team members are committed to do this for one year. So their year begins in August. In about six week or five week training time at the camp. We have 150 acre campgrounds in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which is our headquarters. And uh, so we begin there, the process of getting everything ready to go and all the training and musical or, or logistical and all the things that it takes. And then we can be, begin, begin traveling on the road. We just came from Rochester, New York, and we'll head for, after this week, Lord willing, we're going back into Michigan for three weeks and then over to Wisconsin then down into Indiana, then back to Ohio, then back, that gets us home down December the 2nd. And then after that time, they get a little bit of a break, they go home, then we come back in January, go from January till May. And then during that time, we're traveling down south. We try to stay away from the northern states that have anything called snow. <laughs> and not because we don't like snow. In fact, they're out there, I was looking for a place to play in the snow, but the, the vehicles in the snow is not a good idea, so we go south, and we travel with the ministries there. And then in April, on April 1st this year, we'll be headed for Zambia, Africa, sharing in the ministry there. We'll give you an update on all the stuff going on there, sometime throughout the course of the week. And then, of course, the young people are involved in camp. We have a camp there, a Bible camp that operates all summer. Operates now as well, but not as uh, fluently as in the summertime where they're involved in that. Everyone's a missionary. They raise their own support, trust God to supply their own finances. Greatly doing that, and we're so happy, excited about the way God is surprising us, surprising us for the way He cares for us, but it shouldn't surprise us. A few weeks ago, I sat in my office and some guy was asking me a bunch of questions about encounter. And as I explained to him how God answered, answered prayers and put it all together, he said, This is impossible. I said, You're right, it is impossible. But not with God. Nothing's impossible with Him. He can supply it, He has raised up and continued to provide for the ministry so we can continue. Uh, when I'm driving down the road, I'm looking, I think I paid four dollars and twenty-three cents for diesel fuel yesterday. And then we're paid four twenty-three. And so you see the prices keep going up and wonder, but God just keeps supplying. Somebody said, What are you gonna do if the prices go up? Said, well, let me see, what's my option? I could tell the guy at the pump, I'm praying about this. <laughs> After I fill it up. <laughs> now that doesn't seem like a good idea. So I think I'll just keep pumping the fuel and driving down the road until I get word that God is out of money. As soon as I get the word that God has run out, then we're going to go back home and figure out something else. But until then, we just be comfortable and trusty in the storm, whatever the storm is, he gives peace. A number of things on the book table, the resource table, we'll get to side. Please take time sometime throughout the course of the week to take a look at those things. Uh, we're going to give you an update on all of those ministries where we're involved, we're excited and thrilled about what God is doing opportunities to provide for us to be able to share ministries here and around the world. So we'll share those things with you and uh, give you an idea how you can pray for the ministries we continue to invest in those things. I was in the hospital some months ago and one of the things that they, they kept asking me about, although I was in there for, I had a pinched nerve in my back on Christmas Day, um, I had just gone outside when we were, we were at home and we were expecting some guests, and so I had just gone outside to make some preparation for them, and in a split second, I couldn't move. Only discovered it was a pinched nerve in my back, and so they called the ambulance, and you know, I spent some time in the hospital, a week in the hospital, while they're trying to figure out what to do with it. But every day they came in, they asked me, they came in to check my heart. And I kept telling them, it's not my heart, it's my back. <laughs> my heart is okay, you can see I'm still working. But they were so concerned about the heart, well, I guess that's a good idea, since you only have one. Nice to have that thing going, but heart trouble. Everybody's concerned about heart trouble today. But then I got to think about that every day. In fact, you get to think about it even there in the hospital. Heart trouble. The heart trouble is critical. But I'm going to think then, Pastor, maybe that's our biggest problem in church. You got heart trouble. Heart trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So the 
Some of us in an imaginary setting now. And we'll see what this guy finds out about heart trouble. You know what? I can't believe you taught me into this. Dad, it's for your own good. Oh, please. For my own good. I know it's good for me. Then you know this is the best thing for you. You know what? I've been around a lot longer than you have. And that's exactly why you're here. <laughs> Hello. Good morning, gentlemen. My name is Dr. Williams. John Stevens? I'm John Stevens. We're, We're both John Stevens. I'm John Stevens, Jr. This is my dad. Okay, now which one of you is the one with the problem? He is. No, he is. You are. You're all the problem. I'm John Stevens. Both of you seem to be experiencing a little confusion. Look, Doc, my son, you're forced me to come in here. He says I'm having some kind of heart trouble. Heart trouble? What kind of trouble? Well, you see, my dad's a Christian, but his heart isn't in the right place. Oh, please. My heart is where it's always been. No, it's not. Where do you think it's hurt? That's why I'm not worried. You know what, Doc? I'm sorry. This is a huge mistake. As you can see, I am a perfectly healthy Christian. <laughs> Look, Doctor, if you could just examine my dad, maybe you know that we'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, let's, let's just take a look. I'll tell you, I'm not putting on one of those hands. It's okay. All right. You can sit down right here. And you're not going to find anything either. Let, let me just ask you a few questions. Now, you, you are a Christian, right? <laughs> yeah. 20 years and counting. <laughs> Do you uh, attend church? Faithful. How's your family history? All Christians. True. But there has been our trouble. Prideful hearts, hard-heartedness, cold-heartedness. It's run out of the family for years. True. Tell me a little bit about your diet. Well, let's see. I'm being spiritually fed and, uh, and I take my daily bread. You exercising? Yeah. I exercise my faith every day and guard my testimony. In church? <laughs> Usually. So, uh, how's my heart? Well, from everything you just told me, your heart sounds fine. Ha! Told you, we're out of here. So long, Daco. Hold on. Uh, what about everything you haven't uh, told me? Yes. What haven't you told me? What about all the signs of heart trouble you haven't mentioned? Are you having certain symptoms? Well, I mean, every once in a while. Well, he's experiencing discomfort. Where? In church and around other Christians. Numbness. Where and when? Every time someone needs a helping hand. Even pain. Pain? Okay, so maybe it's painful when I know I should be helping someone else and I don't. Fatigue. It's fatigue, son. Uh, explain. Okay, so I am tired of helping out at church, tired of ministering to others, and tired of sacrificing for the kingdom of God every single day when nobody else will. He's lost his balance. He used to be helpful in giving to others. Now he's self-centered and self-absorbed. Kid's right. So, uh, how am I? Go ahead. <laughs> I can take it. I'm a man. <laughs> well, you do have heart trouble. Oh, boy. I was afraid of that. Heart transplant? No, not an option. You already received a new heart when you asked Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior. And, uh, so, I mean, what's wrong is that you lost your servant's heart. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah. The only way to strengthen your heart is to become a servant. Oh, please, but Doc, do you know how long I've been in the church? I'm not going to go in there now and start setting up chairs and vacuuming the floor. Leave that to our janitor. Well, if you're not willing to serve, then don't be surprised if you lose your heart for God altogether. Okay. So what do I do? Here, let me give you a prescription. Follow this and you'll be the great man you desire to be. Here. Do this, and you'll never have to come back in for a follow-up. You two gentlemen have a good day, and stay home. Can't stop. So what's it say? Well, it says, If any man desires to be first, let him be the servant of all. Mark 9.35. So I guess you were right. I do have some heart trouble. And I will too if I don't learn to keep my servant's heart. You know, I can't believe I'm saying this, but thanks for insisting I come in here today. Oh, no problem. I knew you did. <laughs> well, anyway, we better get going, otherwise we're going to be late to your other appointments. Yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean other appointments? You got to come in here. 
Now, I have appointments lined up for you all day. The back guy, the neck guy, the shoulder guy, we gotta get the vision check. The feet have a funny smell coming up for those. And so, mine said something about here. My what? My hair? Yes, my hair is fine. It runs in the family too. So, how about this? I got a better idea. Forget these appointment things and forget about what your mother said. And we will go out for ice cream, huh? Here. Sound, sounds great, but uh, you're serving me. Son, you self serve. Well, yourself is going to serve me. <laughs> well, let me remind you that we do have hard troubles. And often it's uh, hard hearts, callous hearts, uncaring hearts, sinful hearts. And on the list goes, we need to check for it. Check to see how our heart is our doing. And that's uh, really what we'll be sending out all week long. How's your heart? So we ask to answer that question to each one of us. As the doctor asks us, how's your health? And spiritually, we get with our Bible in the moment of the Lord. How's your heart? Being honest, what we know is true. Paul reminds us in Corinthians where he says, we have this treasure in an earthly vessel. The treasure is Christ and what he's doing in your life, in my life. We have this treasure in an earthly vessel. That word earthen vessel means old clay pot in the text. And the desire, the God's desire is out of this old clay pot would come what God wants the world to see. Let your light shine so before men, you may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We, I think, kind of got it messed up. We thought, well, we'll invite everybody to come to church. And we all invite people to come to church. But sometimes they're hindered when they come. Because they say, oh, you mean that guy goes to church? He's a Christian. She's a Christian. Could never tell by the way they act. So we don't become good representatives. I was this clay pot. So what come, came out of our old clay pot last week? Well, in the Old Testament, remind me, when the prophet was told, why don't you go down to the potter's house and I want to teach you a lesson. So he gets down to the potter's house and watches the potter make a vessel. Interesting, years ago I had the joy of going to a place in Detroit called Reedville Village. And that time they had a guy making a, a vessel on an old wheel. And I watched him as a kid. I watched him make that vessel. Like many things I've forgotten, but I remember that. I remember him. And he would take the edges off of that and break the edges off of that and then he'd mold it again. And then he even, part of that time, he took the, kind of took the whole thing and started over again. Well, the scripture says, can I do with you what the potter does with the vessel? So the Lord asks us the same question, can I do with you? He's trying to make us a vessel fit, as Paul said to Timothy, fit for the master's use. The old clay pot, what's going on with this old clay pot? Well, the master, molding and shaping it, bringing things into our life, not allowing things to come into our life, directing us, changing us, to make us what he would have us to be. A vessel fit for its use. Well, the songwriter put it in a song for us, entitled The Potter's Hand.
so kids, you can have the back way of the team and meet you there. And while they're doing that, uh, they're giving you an outline. I hope you have a pencil and pen. You can jot down some things this morning. As we begin our time together, our journey, our spiritual journey together, we've had a great time this week. Our spiritual journey together as we share the truths, let down this Christ I know. As we share the truths of God's word and look in what God has for us. We always have to be careful we don't become like some Christians, we know, pitch for Christians, and they're pitching it over to the other person behind them, where they need that, where they need that, give it to them. But opening our heart and mind to what God would have for us as He changes us. And it does our change, it desires to set us free. We get two things, we get saved, we get a thousand, but two main things. You get freedom from the family of sin, it's all taken care of. Christ paid the price on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. Then you get freedom from the power of sin. We don't have to sin any longer, we choose to do that. Now that doesn't mean we're perfect, we're not, we've never reached that, of course. But, Paul is reminded, us, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. So you, you choose to do that. So you get freedom from the penalty and the power of sin. Our, st our studies throughout the course of the week are centered around one passage of scripture, and that's in Proverbs. Turn your Bible to Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24, as we center our thinking this week around the, the matter of the garden. We're coming to the garden. In thinking and praying just a few months ago as to where God would have us to consider sharing opportunities from church to church. I came to this passage of scripture and spent a long time here thinking about it. And there's so much we can learn from this passage of scripture. Proverbs, I'm encouraged to look at Proverbs. The Proverbs are exciting to go. Somebody years ago, and I don't even know who did this and how I even started, but somebody encouraged me years ago to read one chapter of Proverbs every day. If you read it every day, you read through it every month. If you read through it every month, by the time you, it logs up, it piles up. If you don't try to memorize it, you just read through it. You read through it every month, year after year after year, and uh, that piles up. And it, it's just a great way to have the Word of God implanted in, in, the, in the book of Proverbs. So much truth, so much power about changing our life. Well, we come to Proverbs chapter 24, and we're down to verse number 30. Verse number 30. In verse number 30, we're trying to get the picture this morning. We're talking about the picture, and then we're going to back to this picture many, many times throughout the course of the week. In Proverbs chapter 30, it says, I went by the field of the slothful. Now, there's much, there's much about slothfulness, and we'll touch on that briefly, because that is critical. But it said, I went by the field of the slothful, and by the vineyard of a man void of understanding. Now, to get the picture, if you would please, this is like a garden. We'll, say, we'll call this a garden rather than a field. So we went to the garden, and many of you have gardens, I suppose, and you remember the day when you took care of the garden and you treated it carefully and you checked it regularly, and then, then you forgot about it, and that's the kind of picture we have here. So I went by the field of the uh, vineyard of the man who would understand it, and lo, it was all grown over with thorns, and never was covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Now, after he did this, in verse number 32, it says, Then I saw, and consider it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. So he went to the garden, walked by the garden, looked at this garden, and we're going to come back and look more in detail about this. And then he said, I learned from this. Now remember, remember in Scripture, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished in all good works. So all Scripture, that we would say, every passage, every verse, is inspired by God, is there for a reason. So he says in this passage, I, and it's recorded for us, I went by the garden, I observed what was there, I observed that there was once a nice garden, now it's all grown over with weeds. Weeds, of course, would represent. Now, by the way, we're not, this is not a lesson on gardening. All the way through Scripture, especially in the Gospels, but all the way through Scripture, we have pictures, mental pictures that are painted for us so we can understand it better. Jesus was a master of this. Every time he taught, he drew a picture. 
not on the screen and on the board, but in the mind of the people. And so here in this passage, we have a picture, a picture of a garden. You know, the instruction is not how to have gardens. Same as was in Matthew chapter 7 when Jesus talked about building our on the right foundation. He wasn't talking about building houses, although that's a good principle. The principle of work in your garden, but that's not what he's talking about. He was talking about your life and my life. And here he's talking about your life and my life. It's not a garden, it's a life. A lot of truth about this matter of the garden. Somebody I was reading just recently, somebody suggested, if you want to know what your life garden will look like in one year, check to see what you just got done planting this week. Now, Christians are the only ones that I know that believe that God does magic. They must believe it because they practice it. Because here's what they do. They plant something in their life garden. Nobody knows, well, except God. Nobody knows. They plant something in the life garden, and then they back away from it, and then they pray, Oh God, don't let this come up. Oh God, I didn't really mean this. Now you know that doesn't work in your garden at home. In your garden at home, you plant corn, but decide the next day you didn't want corn, you wanted beans. So you go out to your garden and you pray over it. Oh God, change these seeds into beans. And what happens? Nothing. But Christians actually believe that they can plant any seed they want and ask God to either bless it or curse it and it'll change it. Well, it doesn't work in the garden and it doesn't work in life. So in this garden, we see the once was a nice garden here, but now it's not a good garden. It's destroyed. The weeds are broken in it. The walls are broken down. And so he backs up and he learns from this picture. And that's what we want to do this morning. Learning from the word. Learning from this picture and the picture we have of the garden. Remembering it's not the garden, it's your life and it's my life. Well, first thing he said, the wall was broken down. Now the wall, of course, will be protection for the rest, so the garden is safe. So we're going to think about why walls are important. <laughs> some, some of our staff are back at the camp, so decide they're going to have a garden. Now, that's nice. I'd like, for, I'd like for you to have a garden. I'd like to eat things out of your garden, as long as you take care of your garden. But they plant in the garden. Then. But we live in the woods. In the woods we have deer, lots of them. We have rabbits, lots of them, and we just discovered the last few days we have black bear that like it down where we live too. Well, so they planted this garden, and soon they discovered they had nothing left to eat because all well, the animals were enjoying it. So they built walls. Well, really, they put a fence up. So fence becomes important for the garden. Now, let's think about why walls are important in your life and mine. Now, remember the passage. It says, he went by the garden, he looked at what happened there, and he backed up and said, now what did I learn from this? So here's what we're learning from the passage. First of all, walls are important in your life for protection from evil. You and I need to build walls around our life. Walls are guidelines, walls are standards, walls are convictions, walls are rules, walls are principles. Building walls around our life. Now, I don't mean we build walls around our life so we don't talk to anybody. But we build walls around our life for protection. It's obvious in this passage that he is teaching us that the walls are down and now the garden is being destroyed. We need to build protection around our life. We come to today in our society, even with among believers, when they believe, just let the walls down. When you do, you are asking for trouble. So walls around my life garden are there for protection. Walls around the life garden are important to keep us focused on what is right. It helps us focus on what is right. It's a reminder. The walls are a reminder. The walls are truths of scripture. The walls are experiences God has done in our life. The walls are principles, and they remind us where to keep our focus. It doesn't take long for you focus to get off. Driving down the road, 
As you drive down the road, you have somebody say, look over there. And then they say, no, don't look. We were driving down the road, and we went from one place to the other, and there was a huge drop off over there. I mean, I mean, a long ways down. And my wife said, told me, look, look over there, isn't that pretty? And as soon as I looked, she told me to quit looking. Because you can lose your focus in a split second. So can you win life? The enemy would like to get your focus off and my focus off. When the walls come down, we lose our focus. Walls are important also because they keep us on the right path. Walls would keep us on the right path. It's important to be on with the right path, to go the right direction. So the walls become important. Now remember, it's the garden of your life. Interesting project might be if you took a blank piece of paper and really drew what your garden looks like. What's growing in the garden? Are there any fences? Or are the fences down, the walls down? It helps us keep on the right path. Walls are also important because it's a testimony for the truth. The scripture says we're supposed to be salt and light in this world. And one of the reasons we are not is when the walls come down. Current philosophy of Christian society is let's be just like the world. There's no place in Scripture that would indicate that. Besides, the world is not looking for someone just like them. The world is looking for someone that has someone or something they don't have. That's when you and I can become salt and light. But when the walls come down, there's not a testimony for truth. Walls are important because they help us teach the next generation. I came a few months ago, or a few, yeah, a few months ago, to Psalm chapter 78. I sat in my office one day and was contemplating, praying about the ministry and what God had allowed, what, what I sensed God was to allow for the future. And my mind, by the Spirit of God, was driven to Psalm 78. And Psalm 78 verses 1 through 8, it reminds us that you and I as older people are supposed to be teaching the younger people. What are we supposed to teach them? What God did in your life and mine so that they won't go astray like others have. We walls are important in your life and mine so we can teach the next generation. There's a verse of scripture that says, and there was a generation that did not know God. They exist today. We have young people come to camp and not from other countries but from down the street. And when we hand them a Bible, they say, what is this? They're almost as bad as some people in India. I remember hearing a pastor from India talking about, said they were going from village to village telling people about the Lord. As they went from village to village, they'd say to the people, do you know Jesus? One man responded to him, you know, I've lived in this village all of my life. I do not know him. Maybe he lives in the next village. That's the way it almost is in our country. Because the walls have come down. We need walls so we teach the next generation. We need walls so we can reach the world. Come in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. When you and I become the instruments in God's hand, the vessel in God's hand, then we can reach the world. There's never been a day when we could reach the world like we can today. Did you ever imagine that you'd be able to sit in your living room and open up your computer and talk to somebody in Africa? But you can't do that. We need walls, protection, a life that makes a difference so we can reach the world and maybe become God's representative. The scripture says, you are my representatives. Representatives are those are different. How's the garden? How did our garden look this week? Are we dabbling in evil? Are we walking right, keeping our path focused in the right place? There are some walls that are broken down. We're instructed in this passage of scripture to look and to learn. Look and to learn for our own good. So we can back up and look at some of the walls 
that are possibly broken down. There were so many. Let me suggest a few of you. One of the fences, the one of the walls is broken down. Is the wall of it's spiritual drifting? It's broken down, and we're not concerned. We're rarely concerned about the matter of drifting. Somebody said, "Well, I used to go to church. I used to read my Bible. But not anymore. I don't have time." So this wall, the fence, has come down. It's destroyed, and so we're drifting. Not concerned about spiritual things. So many things that are available for us in this world, in this society in which we live, and so many of them are wonderful, but the wall is spiritual driven. So look at the garden. The walls are down. Because of that, the spiritual driven. There's another wall that's fallen down, and that's the wall of parental guidance. Both are two extremes. The wall of parental guidance being given and the wall of parental guidance being ignored. Children grow up today and discard the Word of God. They say parents are old. So they tear down the walls. Some of the, suggest the scriptures suggest this. Don't tear down the walls until you ask what the walls were put up in the first place for. The wall of parental guidance. Both parents guiding their children and children listening to them. The walls of values. Right and wrong. Rules for living. Values. The day of values, having big scriptural values and biblical values is nearly gone. And the garden is a disaster. The wall of Bible doctrine. Bible doctrine. Not studied, not maintained. We have new Bibles. New methods and other methods of study, but very shallow on time. Standing for the truths of this word, knowing that we build our life on the right foundation, the walls of doctrine hold us firm so that every wind of things that comes along and every new preacher that comes along doesn't wipe us off our feet. There's a book on every possible thing that you could imagine. Someone suggested, they asked me, when are you going to write a book? And then I go to the bookstore and look at all the books. Who needs another book? There's a book on everything. There's a book on every fragment of doctrine. You and I need to build walls built on the doctrine and the truths of this book. But that's been the problem. The walls of godly habits, godly habits, being godly today and standing firm for the truths of God's word and living differently is now labeled as legalism. So we become afraid. And they say, you're going to live godly, you're going to have godly habits, you're going to be different from the world, then you're a legalist. And so we back off and found the walls of godly habits. No time for godly, no time to adjust and adapt and build godly habits. The wall is condemned. So there are very few who are different from this world. We become like this world. Talk like them, think like them, dress like them, go where they go, do everything they do. With the vain thought that we're going to reach them. And it doesn't work. The wall of godly habits. Acting, talking, living like a Christian. The wall of Bible reading and prayer. Very little of Bible reading today. Most of us have more Bibles in our home than we can imagine. In fact, there are organizations that plead for people to give all your extra Bibles around the house. Give us your Bible, we'll send them to someone. We have Bibles, but we will read. No time for prayer. Oh, we have time to pray when we're sick. When it's in the hour of tragedy, in the hour of hurting, it was time to pray. But the rest of the time, hey God, I do this myself. I think one of the great tragedies of America is we are self-sufficient. We don't need God for anything. We have money, we go to the bank. 
Well, if I shop, we just go get it. No need, God. So don't pray. Ere you left your room this morning, did you think to pray? The songwriter said, The wall of idle prayer has come in. The wall of public profession of Christ. Standing for Christ. With an uncontaminated testimony. Not a mean that we have to walk around with silence. If you have to walk around with silence and you says, I'm a Christian, there's probably something wrong. But it's living like one. And not trying to force it on everyone, just living like one. And not being ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We have many open doors to us today. But the wall of a public profession of Christ. Someone said, well, I'm a silent witness for Jesus. I don't read any place about silent witness. I think we'll have to be a witness for Christ no matter where we are. But a silent witness for Jesus? I doubt we're going to get to heaven. And when you get there, we're standing there listening to people talk about how they got, how they got in, how they came to know Christ. And someone said, well, I was one by a silent witness for Jesus. Nobody said a word about that. <coughs> Our life impacts other people. But it's the public profession that makes a difference. The wall of character. Character. Integrity. Purity. Trustworthiness. Honesty. Is gone. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 to 11, if you want a passage to start with. Second Peter chapter 1, 5 to 11. Verses 5 to 11 give you a list of character things that ought to be in your life and mine. And it says we ought to add these things to our faith. And if these things be in our life, you will never fail a fall. The character points. The wall of character. Not much emphasis on character. Keeping it, building it, or changing. The wall of biblical thinking and thought patterns has come down. Our thinking has been invaded by the world. We need walls around our life. But this wall has been broken in. I think the greatest, one of the greatest difficulties, the greatest problems that you and I need to contend with living in this world is to be careful we don't think like this world. We're not supposed to think like this world. We're supposed to be totally different. Everything that you and I think about is supposed to be totally different from the world. Comes to money, we're not supposed to think like, like the world is. Comes to possessions and things, I'm not supposed to think like the world. Comes to marriage, I'm not supposed to think like, like the world. That everything we're supposed to think differently. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. That means, and Paul said, quit acting like the Gentiles. Those are unbelievers. Quit acting like that. You're not supposed to act like this. Walk worthy of this vocation which you have. So we're thinking. But we've dropped down the fences. We've dropped down the walls. And so the world marches right in. Watches right into our living room and sits down. And gives us their thinking and thought patterns. And we wonder, why do our kids act like that? Because they've been programmed with the wrong thinking process. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. We drop the walls. I went by the garden and I noticed that the weeds were up all over the place and the walls were broken down. And what did I learn? I learned that this guy has not been careful. And we began to think like the there are some other walls that are broken down. The walls of God honoring music. Not what music in many cases is not pointing people to God. It's pointing people to the people seen. It's not God honoring. Great, great confusion today. Great argument over the matter of music. But the wall has come down. And the music, in many cases, is not honoring God. It's honoring the person. 
There are other walls, but let me suggest to you one more. And that's the wall of the biblical marriage and family. Marriages are shaking today. Devotion and commitment are nearly lost. Love is nothing. Families are disaster in many cases because the wall of the biblical marriage. The biblical the matters of marriage and family and home and children and relationships have been lost. If we just took this one area and looked at the garden of the marriage and the garden of the family. In many cases, we would be shocked. Behind the closed doors of that beautiful home that we just drove by, it's a war zone. Because the walls have come down. What happens when the walls come down? There are great results, problems when walls come down. These are just some of the possibilities that we can learn. Now what are we doing? We're learning from the book. The book says the weeds were grown, the walls were down. He said, I step back and I learn. So we look at life, we look at the truths and principles, truths and principles of scripture, then we look at life. Now what are some of the results? When the walls are broken down, our thoughts go astray. The mind is confused, it's polluted, and it's corrupt because the walls have come down. So thoughts go astray. Not only that, when that happens, the mind becomes full of evil. Thinking, thoughts that are not of God. Paul said in Corinthians, he said, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts the power of his knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. <coughs> but when the walls come down, and we allow the world to come in, and the weeds to grow, then our minds become corrupted. The good is gone, and the bad comes in. You remember your garden? One day you went out there and you picked tomatoes. It was good. You picked the other things that you planted. But then you didn't have time to take care of it. And the good was consumed. And the bad took over. <laughs> Interesting thing about weeds, you don't have to plant any. They grow on their own. We're going to study a little bit about weeds this week as we think about weeds in our garden. But the good is consumed and the bad comes in. When the walls are broken down, the results of that, there's no Christian testimony. The lighthouse is out. The old Moody said years ago, a lighthouse never sounds a sound or never gives a shout. All it does is shine. But in many cases, the light is out. That's why he had years ago, I was thinking right for him, let the lower lights be gleaming, send the gleam across the way. The lower lights were out. There's no Christian testimony when the walls are down and the garden is destroyed. The world began to control our lives. We act and talk and live like the world. The world controls us. You are not your own if you're a believer. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which belong to Him. Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. But in many cases, we are. Because the walls have been down, the weeds have grown, the sins have grown. The world controls our life, and evil flourishes. There's evil on every hand today. Every hand. Sometimes I 
say to the team members, you know, I remember the good old days. There were good old days. There'll be more sin. There's always been sin. There's always been bad. But it hasn't been blatant. And on every billboard, and on every poster, and on every sign, and on every door, on every place, every time you turn the TV, it hasn't been every place. But evil now is first. Well, you say, brother, these are the last days. Don't you know? Yeah, I know. But that doesn't mean you and I ought to sit down and take a nap. Or let our garden grow. But one of the reasons that evil is flourishing, I believe, is because believers have to take care of their garden. And if they had walls, and if they had the life that made a difference, evil would set up and make attention. When the walls come down, there's destruction. Destruction of family. Destruction of life. Destruction of freedom. Destruction of the church. Wise person said years ago, the church will not be destroyed from the outside, it'll be destroyed from the inside. When the walls come down and the garden is destroyed, we are the church. The church is not just building. We are the church. And when the walls are down and the garden is a disaster, the church is in trouble. So what should I do? What to shall I do about walls? Now, you know, as soon as I say anything about walls broken down, you think of a Bible character? Nehemiah. Right? Nehemiah. So Nehemiah heard about the walls. And he was heartbroken over the thing. And he decided to do something about it. He decided to get involved. So, so he prayed, the Bible tells us. And then he got a plan. And then he sacrificed to make it happen. He worked hard to make this happen. He, in, he endured the problems. He, in, he impacted other people. And he built the walls. That's what we're united. The walls, and I'm really getting concerned about the walls being down. The walls in our life, the walls in, of believers. The walls down, the heart is filled with wrong things. What do we need to do? Well, I mean, let me give you a few suggestions as we close this one. First of all, I would suggest that we need to wake up. Now, Paul said, we need to wake up out of our sleepiness because of the day of our salvation is draws nigh. He's talking about the day that we'll be taken out of this world. It's coming. We need to wake up and realize the seriousness of this situation. This is a serious hour in which we live, the serious great opportunities in which we live, great opportunities in which you and I can carry on and for the truths of the gospel, but in many cases, we got troubles. We need to wake up and do something about our garden. When you discover something wrong with your garden, you don't, at home, if you discover you go out there and it's filled with weeds, you don't go down to the neighbor's house and holler at him to take care of your garden. Only Christians do that. They look at their garden. My garden's a mess. I think I'll change churches. My garden's a mess. Let's get rid of the pastor. My garden's a mess. Let's go buy another Bible. We are more Bibles than we know what to do with. In fact, probably all of us in this room, they've been Christians for very long. You know enough Bible truth. You wouldn't have to learn one more Bible truth. No, I, I didn't say we shouldn't, but you wouldn't have to learn one more. You've got enough to keep you busy for a lifetime. Just what you know right this moment. We need to wake up. This is a serious, serious matter. The gardens don't look good. What else should we do? We need to get up. We need to get up. Paul said, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. We need to get up and start taking care of our garden. How is your life? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Wheresoever a man soweth, that is he also reap. Looking at our life garden. Those of us that are parents, look at the life garden of our children. Those of us that are grandparents, look at the life garden of, the, of our grandchildren. Those of us that have opportunity to leave, look at the garden of other people. We need to get up and start building gardens and walls and fences again and taking care of the garden. Here's a lot of really great about this. You try this at home. You go out in your garden. 
And there's weeds out there. Oh God, please take care of these weeds. Please kill all these weeds. Thank you. If you if you ever have one weed die from that, I'd like to hear that. Because I have some prayers for you. But it's not going to happen. Because God says we need to take care of it. It'll be in him. Now wait a minute, you say, you can't work your way to heaven. We're not working our way to heaven. We're not working to get there. We're doing this because we're already going there. So we need to get up. We need to wake up. And we need to fix up. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, he said, 7 chapter 1, he said, taking all the filthiness out of this temple, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let's fix up the garden. If I walk out the garden, it's full of weeds. I don't need to pray about it. I don't need to sing over it. I don't need to memorize the verse of scripture. I need to pull weeds. You have weeds in your life, garden, sins? Fix it. Do something about it. Take control. Here's an interesting thought. Everyone in this room is as spiritual as they really want to be. Everyone that calls yourself a Christian is as spiritual as they really want to be. Because you can do anything you want to do about your life. You can fix it, you can wake up, or you can leave it like it is. So I need to wake up, I need to get up, I need to fix up. Then I need to reinforce the fences, the walls. James chapter 1, verse 20 says, don't, verse 22 says, don't just be a hearer of the word, be a doer of the word. Do something. You and I have children, we have marriages, we have grandchildren, we have people responsible for, we have a world that's waiting for the truths of the gospel. We need to reinforce the fence so our life will be what I want to be. And then we need to build new fences. Build new fences. Strengthen the matter of character. Strengthen the matter of values. Strengthen the matter of what we know about the truths of God's word, the doctrine that we have. Building those fences so our life curtain won't be destroyed. It won't be filled with weeds. I went by the garden and was lost. I saw it all grown over in weeds. Now he's covered the face grew up. And the stone walls were broken down. So I back it up and but where did I learn from this? I can learn that a little slumber, a little sleep, a little fold in the hand. In other words, if I don't take care of this, I'm gonna have a mess. So, would you look at your life garden as your Now scripture says that all scripture which we thought about a few minutes ago, is profitable. So let me ask you, as you look at your life garden, any walls or fences down? Any thorns, nettles covering the face of your garden? Well, we say, well, wait, can I wait and fix it later? Yes, you can. If you want the consequences that come with it. So I walk out of my garden. It's been a beautiful garden for a long time. I see the weeds are growing. Up. Well, I'm, I'm busy today, so I'm going to put this off until next week. Okay. I can do that. But when I do, I agree to accept the consequences of slothfulness. So yes, you can. It's your life burden. You can fix it or not. You can build the walls and begin to rebuild the walls or not. You can take care of the weeds or not. But what do we do? As one wise man said, every time you make a choice, you also choose the consequences for the results. Life burden. How's our burden? What do we need to do? Let's pray. As we've come to Scripture this morning, I trust that you've been able to carefully examine your own life heart. 
It's not your neighbor's lifeguard. It's not your husband's lifeguard, your wife's lifeguard, your children. It's first of all ours. How does your lifeguard really look? Some fences have come down. Some weeds growing. Then what do you need to do? What do you need to take care of? In the quietness of this moment, I would encourage you to begin taking care of the garden. Whatever it needs, whatever the needs are, you begin now. We might try to be able to pray with you this morning. Wonder how many be honest. You say, already pray with me this morning. My life card never looked very good. I know what I need to do. I just need to do it. And I'm committing to God right now to build fences, to repair the walls, to take care of some things and weeds in my life card. God's convicting you of it. You're beginning it right now. You say, please pray with me. It be my joy to be able to pray with you this morning. If that's where you are today, that's what's going on in your life, would you just slip your hand up so I can pray with you? My life is already going to look good today. I need to make some changes. And I'm making those the quietness of my heart right now. Please pray with me. If that's where you are, would you just slip your hand up so I can pray with you? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you being honest. Thank you. Others say, pray for me. My heart is going to look good today. And I know. I need to make some changes. Others say, pray for me. That's where I am. Say, can I do this without raising my hand? Well, of course. <coughs> Lord, I do pray for each one to just raise their hand as they think about their life and birth. Things that need to be changed, added, stopped, repaired in their life. May they be careful to obey you and obedient in every area that you touch their heart. Lord, for each one of us to call us out believers, may we be careful to examine our life in the light of your word. Lord, I pray there'll be one here today that doesn't know you in a personal way. They've never been transformed and changed. Lord, they may have realized today that you love them. You paid the price for their sin. You desire to set them free. If they will just come in obedience to you, surrender to you, allow you to do the work that only you can do in their life. Lord, thank you for speaking to us today. Once again, we commit the entire week to you and give you thanks in Jesus' name. Hey, would you stand with me, please? Let's sing together just one verse. Take my life and let it be consecrated to the Lord. Let's just sing this verse together. This will be our prayer. Seven o'clock, right? Seven o'clock. God bless you. Have a wonderful